Gatine is still with us. Now, the Supreme Court on Friday, March 3rd, extended the validity of the old 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira notes till December 31st, stating that the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, must continue to receive the notes from Nigerians. The Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, has urged President Muhammad Buhari to review his administration's plans to obey the recent Supreme Court order on the Naira redesign. Now joining us to further analyze and look at the intricacies of this ruling by the Supreme Court is Yemi Ajayi, a public affairs analyst. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Of course, this whole Naira crunch, Naira redesign, uh, cash withdrawal policy has actually caused a lot of uh, cash crunch in the society, economic downturns, and Nigerians are feeling the hardship. And here we are, the Supreme Court has said the old 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira notes should remain legal tender. Actually, they already gave that ruling from the previous interim injunctions that they've been given. And right now, they've finally given the order that it should remain legal tender till December 31st, 2023. But we're yet to hear from President Muhammad Buhari as well as the CBN Governor Godwin Emefiele. What do you think this portends for yeah. the economy? Yeah, I, I think uh, it doesn't speak well for the economy. Uh, my expectation personally is that the president should come out to address the nation just the way he addressed us, you know, prior to the Supreme Court's mm -hmm. judgment. He should come out and tell us the next line of action. Uh, in the real sense, in the real sense, if we look at it, he shouldn't have a choice, you know, above what the Supreme Court has said. So whether he speaks or not, the Supreme Court judgment is there, but it would be a very big honor for him to come and address us as a nation again. And I'm also a bit taken aback that the CBN hasn't said anything. Mm. I do expect that the CBN by now should have given directives to banks, you know, telling them what to do. Because as this lingers on, it's like a silent battle. You know, it's just like saying, Supreme Court, you've said yes, we have our own thing to mm. do. And we don't know what the CBN is up to. Because if you ask me, I won't even say the CBN is doing a cash swap. They were rather doing cash confiscation. Mm. Because I collect your money, I'm not giving you back. I'm confiscating your money. And you're putting me into a channel that does not have infrastructure to support my transactions. So I think it's very good. It's honorable, it's reasonable for the CBN to come out and issue a directive to banks. But is it and possible for the CBN to issue a directive without that disposition, that body language, or that authorization from President Muhammad Buhari? You'd recall that before now, a lot of people had thought it was a CBN policy and all the hammers and the criticism had gone to Godwin Emefili. But over time, especially after the broadcast, that President Muhammadu Buhari gave February 8th, I think, yeah. the president actually owned up to the policy, saying it was to curb vote buying, it was to reduce the money in circulation, it was to boost the economy and all of that. And so it, it looked like it was, and we've seen the CBN governor meet with President Buhari on several occasions on this matter. So would you say that the CBN governor should be the one to own up or to speak up, or should we wait? For President Mohammed Buhari, because of course it still lies within the monetary and fiscal authorities sure, to decide how this money will get into circulation. Okay, let, let's get to a bit of it. The person that is absolutely responsible for this supervisory responsibility is the CBN governor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once the Supreme Court has passed its judgment, but the, the CBN, let's not forget that the CBN yeah. governor is not involved in the suit. When the Kogi state governor, Zamfara state governor, and Katsina state the governor, took it, they sued the federal government. Okay, they sued the federal government. Yeah. So the, the, the argument that legal giants would give you is that the CBN wasn't even in the picture. They only came into the picture by the reason of their function as a federal government parastatal. State of, absolutely. So I think the president definitely, either he comes out to speak or he orders the CBN you know, to take an action. Yeah, because yes, there is connection. Uh, the CBN was not sued directly; it was the federal government that was sued directly. And when we're talking of federal government, it can be any harm of the government, you know. But I expect that the gov uh, the president should address the nation. If he doesn't want to do that, he should give directive like this: is Supreme Court judgment. Please, CBN, go ahead and you know execute. You know, 
and in execution it's just a simple thing the judgments are very clear allow this not to you know work it. yeah so there's no big deal there for us if we want to obey the rule of law and appear as a same nation to mm -hmm. people around because uh if the government uh wants to do the right thing they should look at the hardship of the people you know, it's actually people, quite people disturbing that the clause if is coming when we're talking about the rule of law because it should be automatic shouldn't it absolutely mm -hmm. but unfortunately if the first ruling uh prelim ruling if you ask me to say was not obeyed, obeyed. so um, i mean the, the question is would this be obeyed again mm -hmm. and if this is not obeyed, it will set a very terrible precedence for the legal practice. I was know. going to come there. I just wanted you to learn. This is not the first time the president has had to flout the Supreme Court order. He has had a history of not taking, you know, you know, paying heed to whatever Supreme Court said. We had issues with El Zanzaki. There was time the Supreme Court allowed or gave an order that he should be released. Yeah. The president never adhered to that. We had issues with Namdi, uh, Namdi Kano. We had issues with Sunday Oboho. And now this is an issue that boils down to the cash policy. And now the CBN has also given a directive that this should continue until December. He is still keeping mum about this, especially paying silent treatment to that particular order. And of course, we've seen cases where APC as a house have been divided among themselves. We've seen cases where the, 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 the government gives their own order, then other governors of the same party are also going against that same order. What does this portend for the party in itself? And of course, as the president will be leaving office very soon, what will this, as a, as a, as a footprint, leave on his um, administration? Yeah, uh, permit me to say without any uh, form of prejudice, it may not be leaving a good record for him if things are not ameliorated or done well right now. Uh, if you look at what happened, the, the grievance within the APC party is basically about the people. When we talk about this cash uh, policy, these governors came out and said they may have their own reasons known to them, but they said we're defending our people, okay? They can ride on the back of anything to do whatever they wanted to say, but you lead certain uh, cases of the president flouting or disregarding the outcome of the Supreme Court's judgment, it's not a good thing. It's making us to feel the rule of law is not relevant in governance. And the moment that crack exists, then we're a failed state. Because that's the last resort, that's the last hope of a common man. Mm. Yeah, justice is the last hope of the but, common but man. The, the president here, yeah, we know there has been precedence of you know, disobeying court order. He has that immunity. So even if there's a contempt of court filed, we know that the president cannot be prosecuted, especially while he's still in office. But do we have a system in place whereby questions are raised, you know, heads are made to roll when it comes, so even when they leave office, such that they are able to, or they are made to face the law. We see what happened with uh, President Donald Trump, who is still in the eye of the storm, by the way, uh, for what happened January 6th, the insurrection of the White House that happened yeah. uh, January 6th. We've seen even Mike Pence, the former vice president of the United States, being questioned for having classified documents. Even same with uh, Joe Biden, the current president. These people are people who are made to sit at the edge of their seats because they know that there is a system in place that would ask questions when you do not do what is expected of you. Absolutely. Do we see any of such happening? We know that, yeah, when they're in office, there's immunity. But when they leave office, do we see any of such happening? No, it depends on who comes in. Hmm. You know, because Should that be the case? That you should, we're in a system where we have a lot of subjectivity based on who is there, what the person's interests basically are. I always define politics as a game of interest. Now, whoever comes in can rather let him be or still go ahead and say, why did you do X, Y, Z while you were there? Mm -hmm. And these cases can come up and be exhumed against him. And he has uh, questions to answer to in terms of law and also regularizing whatever he has done wrong when he was the president. Mm -hmm. Now, the question again, why I said that it depends on who comes in. You know, this thing is about, uh, I would call it more like party party thing. You mm -hmm. know, somebody can come in and say, let's just allow him go. But the bad thing is one person
person will make reference to this sometimes in the Which future. is why it should be about the system, not about the, the person. Individual. But you know systems in Nigeria are built around people, hmm. especially in governance. But we have yeah, an yeah. attorney general of the federation yeah. whose role, amongst other things, is to ensure that the president, you know, uh, goes through the legal process as it should be and uh, explains all of these things, breaks it down. We know that a lot of people have said that perhaps the president was wrongly informed. But that is an excuse that doesn't hold water because Absolutely. he has legal advisors, he has media advisors who are supposed to, you know, direct him in the right way to go. So looking at all of this, the Attorney General uh, of the Federation is supposed to be brought to book when you look at all of this. Maybe after, yeah. I don't think he has any, any immunity to even start with the Attorney General of the Federation. Yeah, well, if you, if you look at Because the PDP it. governors are already calling for his head. That yeah. even no APC governors actually. Uh, we have uh, the those who filed the case, Kaduna State, yeah, uh, Kogi, Kogi State. and Zamfara. Yeah, Zamfara They're yeah. already asking for the head of the CBN governor, the Attorney General, Attorney of the General. Federation. So yeah. it means they don't have immunity. Yeah, well, to an extent they do not, but you see, the, their immunity can be hidden under the person who has immunity. You understand mm. what I mean? It's a game of I co I, I'm the I'm the mother. Oh, I cover my children. Do you understand? But again, uh, that is not how a system should run. A system should run on uh, transparency, and it should run in such a way that when people are uh, to be questioned, they should be questioned, regardless of who is behind them or the tone or the voice behind whatever they're doing. But again, we are in a system where things don't run the way it should run. You mentioned Joe Biden. You mentioned what is happening in the United States. That is a more advanced society. What about South yeah. Africa? Is South Africa more advanced? South Africa's former president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was also made to face the law because Absolutely. of the, the crimes he committed while he was president. Okay, I'll tell you one uh, philosophy about So Nigerian if you say politics. America is advanced, what about an African country? Close Ni by? Ni Nigeria, w Nigeria and Nigerians are different species of human oh, beings. Oh, wow. And I'll tell you one thing. You see, what happens in other jurisdictions may not happen here. At times when people even leave office, they still have a certain level of power and influence. Sadly. You know, there's this sanctified or sanctimonious way of viewing them. Yeah. How would it look like that ex-Nigerian president is answering to a particular thing after he left office? You know, there's a kind of way we, we try to cream things, you know, around people mm. and believing that they are so influential, they are so powerful. Don't let us just do so. Let us allow them to go. If we have to do this and we go back 30, 40 years mm. to dig up what people have done while they were in government, sincerely, we will build more jails than screw in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah. But unfortunately, we're in a system that still cover people that should be questioned even after leaving office. Mm. But we we'll just allow them to just say, well, let's move on, let's move on. We're well, these kind of people. In South Africa, for example, I mean, Ramaphosa has to answer to what is done wrong. Mm -hmm. And they, has to, they have to deal with him. Mm -hmm. So that in the future, someone will make reference to it and say this person was dealt with. Unfortunately, in this crime, even calling for the head of uh, Emefile and uh, Malami and all that, for me, I just feel like, uh, let's just make noise. Mm -hmm. If nothing happens, nobody does anything about it. But in a similar environment where people have... A uh, sense of responsibility and personal decorum, you know, they would rather even be the one to come out and either apologize or say, I'm leaving the office. But that would not happen in Nigeria. Oh, of course, yeah. and you've already covered it by saying that it looks like this is a different climb when it comes to the system we run. But Absolutely. let's look at the implication of this on the average Nigerian out there, those running their businesses and all of that. Right now, a lot of traders are not accepting the old notes, bus drivers, you know commercial, uh, uh, you know, operators are not accepting the old notes and the new notes are also not available. Where does this place that businessman mm -hmm. who wants to run? Of course, we know that they are pushing for uh, cashless policy, do your transactions online. There are skirmishes, there are issues with the network, with transactions online. Where are we? Where does this place the average Nigerian? Yeah, an average Nigerian face, a, uh, face a, a level of uncertainties on a daily basis. You know, you're not certain how your transaction is going to pan out on a daily basis. So you would go with that pain of not knowing, you know, whether your transaction will sell through or not. I've seen situations where people want to make payments 
and uh, they start praying that you know if i give you atm card that i want to make payment somebody will say i'll pray on the atm card if i want funnily said it will pour anointing oil on his atm card so that it can work it just <laughs> doesn't make sense but the real thing is uh the banks i believe they are working hard you know to make things better uh but the bank was not prepared for this mm. in 2010 i was opportune to present a paper to Harvard university on reaching the unbanked in africa and one of the things I mentioned in that paper is that Africa, in terms of the use of technology, is still backward. Before you can bring in cashless policy, it's a five years project. Mm. You need to make but, sure. Well, we started long ago. It's not. We started by easy. talking and not doing. Ah. We only talked. We did not do anything. There, were, there should have been infrastructure. We just learned now that there's something we call stress tests. The technological infrastructure of banks failed the stress test because of the volume of transactions that runs through their system. Mm. They were not prepared for oh, it, the, and they just created a narrow path. And now they had a big bang on them, and now they struggle. Many times people do transactions, it fails. People have their money hanging in banks. Reversal has been very difficult. They should have given banks room first to have that infrastructure in place. If this was not politically driven and motivated, mm -hmm. infrastructure should have been in place. It should have been tested and would have looked at the volume of transaction that will happen if this cashless policy goes on. First, let's look at the volume of transaction that happens on a daily basis across the counter in various banks and use that to benchmark that, okay, if we convert this electronically, would you have the capacity, the infrastructure to manage it? Then we can now move forward from there. After that has been tested over a certain time, people should also be educated and know there, there should be various alternative payment platforms, mm. people having their bank account and all that. So it makes life easier for everybody. If they switch overnight, even the switching also takes certain change process. It should be like a two years, term, like less pay cash. Gradually, people will be more comfortable with cashless. Then when we see at a certain level that we're comfortable with cashless, then we can swim into it. Even in advanced countries, you don't have totally cashless, you know, uh, transactions. Uh, transactions. There are still cash transactions that people do, but it's just limited. It's for control of currency, which is good, but it's not well executed, in my own opinion. Mm. Now, let's talk about system, because earlier on we talked about the fact that the system is not built in such a way that people who sometimes flout, you know, rule of law are brought to book, even after they've left office. So... This administration is about going off now. So what do you think should be put in place to make sure that the system works, not just for the average Nigerian, but for those who occupy sensitive positions as leaders, especially when it comes to obeying court orders? Okay, first, uh, I think there should be a system of accountability. Everybody should be accountable for their action. But um, unfortunately, we don't have that system in place. If people are held accountable for what they ought to do, what they have done, or what they have not done, and uh, also we have a consequence management in place, I think it will give clarity on people's demeanor and misdemeanor in terms of their relationship even with other people. So I think uh, as another government is coming in terms of uh, flouting you know, court orders, I think it should be revisited. What do you think about the independence of the judiciary, especially with regards to government, you know, officers not having control over the judiciary, so that even when cases go to court or individuals go to court, they can as well get justice? Yeah, uh, I think the independence of the judiciary is um, relatively being upheld, but it, can, it could be better. Oh. And one of the ways that that could be better is, uh, for example, where we see clearly that uh, court orders are being flouted, there should be strong consequence management for that. And uh, if I were to be the next person, I'm speaking for myself, what I would do, I would revisit every case that has caused crack in the, cracks in the wall so that we rewrite what has been written wrongly. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you wouldn't be able to do that for the whole of your tenure because you uh, would have a lot to deal with. Absolutely. But talking about the accountability... significant ones. Say, oh, really? <laughs> I doubt you'd be able to even achieve anything because there are a potpourri of issues, cases unanswered to, justices unserved, 
in this country. And correct. so you might not even be able to face the job that you were elected for. You're but you correct. talked about accountability because we have to wrap up now. And I'm looking at the constitutional implication of that. You have to amend the constitution, for instance, if you want to bring someone who is in office to book or to answer questions, then it means some amendments in the constitution have to take place, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. But there's nothing wrong amending the constitution if it doesn't serve the purpose we expect. But those who would amend it are also culprits. H how do you think that would work? It's a web process. So getting out of that web would be a difficult thing. But I always believe one day someone will rise up in this nation that will break the jinx. Mm. And quickly, quickly, right. quickly, quickly address this issue. How does the Supreme Court judge come into place? Because there's this misconception out there that the Supreme Court judge is also directly or indirectly a member of the APC or the ruling party. So how can an individual of the opponent or the opposing party get justice, especially in cases like election fraud? <sighs> well, I cannot categorically affirm that is a card carrying member mm -hmm. of APC. And besides that, but even... if that is the case, it puts the judiciary in a bad light. They okay. should be unbiased in whatever they mm -hmm. do, not prejudiced by any standard. They should do the right thing. But if there is high level of subjectivity based on that assumption or allegation or thought process, that it totally busted. That is the whole thing. We'll just leave it in the realm of speculation yeah. because uh, there is no proof yet as regards to that uh, particular report. But I uh, would we'll, uh, take a break now. We'll be back. There's still more. Yemi yeah, still with us, and uh, we would be looking at other issues. Stay with us. Okay.